Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala seyyidina Muhammedin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. La hawla wa la kuwwata illa billahi al-ali al-adhim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa akina azab al-nar. La hawla wa la kuwwata illa billahi al-ali al-adhim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa akina azab al-nar. So we are beginning from the first lesson in our text. Metan al Ashmawiya. And so we begin the text, or the Shaykh begins the text by saying, Qala Shaykh al Imam al Alimu al Alamatu Abdul Bari al Ashmawi al Rifa'iyu Rahimullahu Ta'ala Sa'alani Ba'd al Astiqa'i and A'mala Mutakadiman fil Fiqi ala Medhab al Imam Mal al Imam Malik ibn Anasin Radiallahu Anhu. فَأَجَّبْتُهُ إِلَىٰ ذَٰلِكَ رَاجِيًا لِلْثَوَابِ The translation and what this means is that he says that the shaykh قال الشيخ the imam al-alim the knowledgeable one al-alamatu al-alamatu means one of much, of much knowledge Abdul Bari and we mentioned this before he's going to mention his name Abdul Bari al-Ashmawiyu because he's from the place of al-Ashma al-Rifa'iyu Rifa'iyu because that's the tariqah that he followed as we mentioned in the introduction to this book Rahimuhullahu Ta'ala May Allah have mercy on him Some of my friends asked me an a'mala muqaddimatan fil fiqhi that some of my friends some of my companions asked me to uh, work on a or to make a compiler to compose a muqaddimatan uh, an introduct, uh, uh, introductory book in fiqh ala madhab al-imam malik according to the madhab of imam malik so my friends asked me to write a fundamental basic book in fiqh according to the madhab of imam malik ibn anas radiyallahu anhu so the author is ex- basically what the author is doing here is he's explaining his reason for writing this book after introducing himself and so he responds by saying, فَأَجَّبْتُهُ And I responded, or I accepted the request from my friends, إِلَىٰ ذَٰلِكَ رَاجِيًا للثواب. I, I I accepted that request, but not just because they asked me, but إِلَىٰ ذَٰلِكَ رَاجِيًا للثواب. Meaning hoping for the, hoping for the reward, uh, and hope for reward, meaning the uh, reward from Allah Azawajal for benefiting the Muslims by composing or compiling this text. So, however, he does mention that some of my friends asked me. This could be a reality that some of his friends did ask him, but sometimes it is a symbol of humbleness that the scholars use such words as friends when he's actually referring to some students who may have asked him or some fellow companions or people of his locality to ask him to write a basic book of um of, uh, of fiqh so that uh, the people could benefit from it. So anyways, the author goes on to mention Babu Nawaqid al-Wudu, which is the first chapter in this book. And Nawaqid al-Wudu is referring to the things that nullify the prayer. I mean, sorry, that nullify wudu, meaning the things that break wudu, meaning after you make wudu, what are the things that will cancel the presence of the wudu so that it would obligate that a person would actually have to uh, repeat his wudu before doing those things that uh, that are necessary, like salah, in order uh, that those things that are necessary, like the prayer, in order for a person's ibadah to be sound. So he mentions i'lam wafqaq Allahu Taala an nawaqid al wudu i ala qismini. The author mentions first saying i'lam no, and then he, after he mentions i'lam. Then he says, وَفَّقَقَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى You can put that in brackets. It means, وَفَّقَقَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى is actually a dua. It's a dua asking that Allah give you the tawfiq, meaning tawfiq meaning the ability to understand. So tawfiq generally refers to ability. And here what he's talking about is the ability to understand correctly. Uh, what is to be said here? So he says, "Alam wafqaq Allahu Taala anna nawaqid al wudu'i ala qismain." That the things that are considered that I mean, the things that nullify a person's wudu can be classified into two categories. Ala qismain doesn't mean there's two 
things that nullify will do, but it means that there's two categories, and under those categories will come several different things. So he says, "Ala qismaini ahdathin wa asbabi ahdathin." The first one is called ahdath, and ahdath we can translate as direct causes that nullify will do. Wa asbabi ahdathin we can translate as indirect causes. So we have those things, ahdath meaning those things which nullify will do. Directly meaning they are the actual cause. And the things that are going to come under the category of asbabi ahdathin are the things that generally are a means in most cases for those actual direct things to occur. And you'll see what that means as we go along. So just keep that in mind. Now the author is going to go on to mention the ahdath. So he says, فَأَمَّا الْأَحْدَاثُ فَخَمْسَةٌ the things that are considered from the category of ahdath are five. Thalathatun min al qubli wa hi al madhi wa al wadi wa al bauli wa thnani min al dubri wa hum al ghaitu wa rihu. So he says that there are five, and three of them are from the genital organ, and they are number one. You can make a list of them. The first one. And genital organ obviously would mean uh, from the, as he's going to mention here, wahi al madhyu. Al madhyu is pre ejaculation fluid. Pre ejaculation fluid is the fluid that a person sees after generally um, having some type of fore foreplay or sexual thought and having an erection at the same time. Then that person gets a type of wetness. The male gets a type of wetness that comes out of the uh, out of the penis of the male, which is considered pre-ejaculation fluid. And for the woman, when she gets sexually aroused, then she gets a wetness. This is called the madhi of the woman. So the first thing that nullifies will do if this madhi comes out, then a person's will do will be cancelled, and he will be obligated to make will do when he wants to perform a, a, an act of worship. In which will do is a condition for it to be sound, like prayer. So he says, "Wahi al madhi, wal wadiyu, wal wadiyu." Not too many people are familiar with it, but you can call it post urinal fluid. Al wadiyu is a kind of thick white fluid that comes out in most cases. Ibn Abi Zaid, Ibn, Ibn Abi Zaid mentions ghaliban aqib al bowl. In most cases, comes out after a person. Urinate. So sometimes a person, as they get older, they're going to urinate. They're going to urinate, and then uh, after they're finished ur urinating, maybe a couple minutes later, maybe even right after, then a person will realize that a thick fluid comes out that kind of looks like uh, the one that we just covered al madhyu, but it's a, it's more thinner. I mean, it's more it's a bit more thicker. So is that's called al wadyu that also nullifies the. Uh, nullifies the wudu. Then the famous one that he mentions, well, bowl, urine, so any any urine coming out of the private part of a male or a female will n will definitely notif uh, nullify wudu. So those are the three things that a person needs to pay attention to that come out of the genital organ of a male or a female that necessitates that wudu is, uh, will become nullified. However, when we look at other texts, um, the author doesn't mention one, which is also one called Al-Hadi. This one is particular for women. Al-Hadi is like a thin watery fluid that women usually excrete just before they give birth. This would also necessitate that the wudu is, is broken. It's called Al-Hadi. And just as a side note, just as a side note to keep in your mind for the study of further texts, sometimes sperm in certain circumstances will only necessitate wudu as opposed to ghusl. So you can add these two to the list that I mentioned. But the one that I mentioned is sperm. You know that obviously in most cases when the sperm comes out, then it necessitates um, ghusl. And that's the normal circumstance. I'm just um, giving you a heads up that in some circumstances which is covered in more detailed books sperm will only nullify would do but a person is not uh, will come to understand the 
technicalities of that later but what matters now is obviously that it is not one of those things that nullify would do originally but rather it is one of those things that necessitate that a person do a full body washing which will be discussed later now those are the three things that he mentioned so we have two more but those two more as he mentions here with nani minad dubur those things that come out from the posterior wahuma al ghaitu wa rihu and those two things are um, excrement what rihu and passing gas so these two things are the only things that will come out out of the uh, out of the rear of a person that will necessitate will do so all together as you mentioned there's five uh, just to cross reference before we go on um, quoting from another book al iziyah there's a few points that we should uh, look at in regards to al ahdath the question that should come about is you know how can we what 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 actually is ahdath i translated it earlier or hadith i should say ahdath is the plural hadith is that thing which is considered indirect now there's a more technical inter- there's a more technical definition of it as uh, al iziyah mentions wa huwa ma kharaja min ahad sabilaini which translates as al hadath, meaning the indirect thing that nullifies will do, which are these five things here, is that which comes out of one of the two pathways. And one of the two pathways, as you can see, that even the text of Ashmawiya mentions here, what comes out of the genital organ or what comes out of the posterior, for example. But there's a very important condition that you should write down and pay attention pay attention to because this last part that I'm going to mention to you is telling you that these things nullify your will do under conditions. And there's two conditions. Allah waj his sihati. When that thing comes out while a person is in a healthy state, wal i'tiyad. And it is in a normal circumstance. These are two conditions which I'll explain to you. The first condition, ala waj his sihati, meaning in a healthy state, is opposed to when that thing comes out in a state when a person isn't in a normal health circumstance. And that is in reference to, for example, when a person has a problem with urinating or uh, excreting or passing gas for example the person who's continuous he can't you know sometimes the, the, the people uh, uh, people have a sickness where when they when they uh, when they go to the when they go to the toilet after they come out of the toilet they constantly always getting dribbles of urine coming out that it's uncontrollable then that means that a person has some type of sickness in his urinal tract or, or somewhere in his body that's that's causing him to constantly urinate. In that case, under certain circumstances, which we won't explain in detail here, and a person can consult a, lear, uh, a learned person, Maliki Fik, concerning this matter, that that doesn't nullify wudu. Because the condition for it nullifying wudu is that it comes out under a normal circumstance when a per- when a person is healthy. So that's the first condition. The second condition is that that thing comes out, those ahdath, those things that we talk about, comes out in a normal manner. What do we mean by normal manner? Meaning that those things exit from the two pathways in a, uh, in normal, I mean, in, in a normal manner. For example, we know that urine comes out of the genital organ. We know that madhi comes out of the genital organ. We know that urine comes out of the genital organ and so on and so forth uh, uh, regarding those things that come out of the posterior. Now let's say something comes out of the genital organ other than these things that we've mentioned here. So for example, a person goes to urinate for example and out of their urinal tract comes blood. Then that won't nullify wudu because that's not a normal circumstance. That's not what normally comes out of the two sabile in the two pathways. So that when it comes out of a genital organ, then no. Or uh, when a person, for example, goes to uh, relieve himself and um, out of his posterior, worms come out. 
You know, sometimes people get worms in the stomach, so use the washman. Only worms come out, for example. Then in that case, that will nullify will do because that's not out of what hit it. Yeah, that's not what normally comes out. So when we're referring to those things that normally come out, we're referring to these things that the, 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 the scholars have listed here and the issue of Hadi, which I mentioned, uh, which I mentioned previously. So keep that in mind as a as a cross reference that the word ahdath is referring to what comes out of the two pathways when a person is healthy and when those things that come out are coming out in a matter that are uh, that are that are considered normal circumstances. Then after he mentions those things, then the author is going to move over and move to the next category, which we said is the second uh, the second category, which are called asbab. And he says, "Wa amma asbabul ahdathi." He says, "As for the as for the the indirect causes, or you can say for those things that are the causes of the ahdath to occur." Then the first one he mentions, Fanomu. He didn't number them. If you notice when we look at the Al Ahdath, he mentions Khamsa. Here he's just gonna he's going to um just mention the 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 the, the Azbab, but he's not going to he's not going to number them. Anyways, the first one that he mentions is Anomu Wahu ala Arbati Aksamin. Now the first one he mentions is sleep. Because sleep has different types. So that's why it says there uh ala arbati aksam, which is four different types. Now the reason why the author is going to mention four different types is because different rules apply to them. In the majority of case, I mean, in some cases, a type of sleep will nullify prayer, and in other cases, it won't nullify prayer. So when he said, when he said, for example, sleep nullifies nullifies uh, wudu, then a person might think that every type of sleep, no matter whether it's light, heavy, long, or short, it nullifies wudu. So he's going to clarify the four different types of sleep, and then he's going to give you the ruling on whether or not it nullifies wudu. So it is as follows. Tawilun thaqilun, long, and he long, heavy sleep. So sleep that is long and heavy, yankudul wudu. This type of sleep is considered, uh, will nullify a person's wudu. The second type is qasirun thaqilun, a sleep that is short and heavy. So the first one that we talked about was long and heavy, and this one that we're talking about is short and heavy. Yan kudul wudu. So both of these two categories that we mentioned so far, they, they nullify wudu. Now if you look closely, these first two that we mentioned share something in one perspective and they're different in the other. The rule that, I mean, the, 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 the characteristic that they share is that they're both heavy. They're both heavy. The difference is one is long sleep and one is and one is short and one is short sleep. So you can easily say here, if you combine between these two, that every heavy sleep will nullify wudu whether it's long or short. That's the gist of what he's telling you. That in, as long as the sleep is heavy, then it doesn't matter whether the sleep is long and sh long and short. Now the question might come to your mind: What is the difference between heavy and what is the difference between? I mean, what's the difference between long and short? And what's the difference between heavy and light? I'll mention that after I uh, mention the third, the third type and the fourth type. So we move on to the fourth, the third type. The third, the third type is qasirun khafifun, a sleep that is short and light. Layan kudul wudu. So a sleep when it's short and it's light doesn't nullify wudu. Then we move to the next one, Tawilun Khafifun. Tawilun Khafifun means that it's long, but it's light. That doesn't nullify wudu. But he says, Yustahabbu min hul wudu. It's recommended to make wudu. So what is he telling you? That it doesn't nullify wudu. So if we look at the four different categories that we have here, the first two that we mentioned, nullify wudu. And the second two that we mentioned, they don't nullify wudu. However, the last one is a little bit different in that although it doesn't nullify wudu, it's recommended to make wudu. So these are the four categories. So what you're actually going to notice about the last two is they share, they share the quality in the sense that they're light. Remember we said in the first two that you'll notice that, even, uh, that both of them are heavy so they nullify wudu. And in the last two we see that both of them are light. And 
and they don't nullify wudu. So you can say if you want to, if you want to put a general principle in your mind to help you out, you can say every heavy sleep nullifies wudu, and every light sleep doesn't nullify wudu. That's a general principle that you can that you can uh, that you can apply here. Now, the question should come is, what is, the, what is the difference between heavy and light? And what's the difference between long and short? So we'll define long and short first, because that's, that's, that's easier. Long and short, as uh, the, the, uh, according to what the scholars mentioned, is long and short goes back to urf. And urf means yani, customs, meaning people say he slept for a long time or people slept for a short time. So, you know, a ballpark figure, there's nothing, there's no fixed duration in this thick matter that says, okay, 15 minutes is long and 20 minutes is short. Generally, Urf tells us that, okay, if a person takes a 45 minute, then that's a long sleep. But if he takes a fifth, you know, a, a snoozer, like 10 minutes, then that'll be considered light. But there is nothing that defines it. But that's not so important. What's more important because... That is what's going to determine whether a person's wudu is nullified or not, is the, is the definition between heavy and light sleep. This is important more than long and short because the difference between heavy and light is the difference between a valid wudu, a, a, a wudu not, be, not becoming invalid and a wudu being valid. You understand? So, heavy, according to the math, they, deter, they define it in different ways, but uh, uh, they all generally uh, come back to the same thing. Some of the scholars define it as heavy sleep is that type of sleep where if a person were sleeping then, he wouldn't be able to recognize or he, he's not aware that somebody's walking back, back and forth. So somebody's sleeping on the couch, you walk past it, you come back, you walk past it, you come back. He's not aware, meaning that type of sleep. It doesn't mean now in fact you have to walk past the couch, couch one or two times now to see if that person is going to wake up or not. It means that that type of sleep He's that heavy. Of a, he's that much. Uh, he's that deep in the sleep that if a person was to walk back and forth, he wouldn't be able to recognize the. You wouldn't be able to distinguish. I mean, you wouldn't. You wouldn't be aware that somebody's walking back and forth. Some other. Some others describe it that he's sleeping so heavy that if he had something in his hand, if it fell out of his hand, he wouldn't be. He wouldn't be. He 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 wouldn't feel it. Meaning, he's in such a deep sleep that if something were to drop out of his hand, he wouldn't be aware of it. Or some of them defined it as um, a person who, uh, where saliva is running out of his mouth. That means a person is totally out. He's sleeping because there's saliva running out of, his, about, out of his mouth and he can't tell. In general, these definitions were only coined, these examples were only coined to tell us one thing. That that person is in his sleep. His, his, his awareness is gone, so he's sleeping. He's ba- pretty much, he's, I mean, he's basically unconscious this sleep is what nullifies the prayer. Light sleep is the opposite of everything that I mentioned. Meaning that if, if the thing dropped out of his hand, he were to wake up. Or if a person was to walk by, he would open up his eye. Then that's considered light sleep. A fourth definition, which I forgot to mention that some of the ulama mentioned, is, um, is the case when... Ah, if a person was to be called... If a person were to be called in a normal voice... For example, you're sitting in the living room and a person sleeping on the couch and you say, Abdurrahman, in a normal conversational voice and he doesn't wake up. Or you have to call him a second time and say, Abdurrahman, a second time. Then in that case, I would also nullify wudu. So that means that light sleep is that sleep in which if, if you were to do one of these four things that I mentioned, then a person were to become aware or you would wake up or at least one eye would open. And that means he, he, he had light sleep. And then we mentioned if that if that light sleep was only short, then it's 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 not uh, his wudu is not broken. But if it was a long light sleep, then it's mustahab for him to make wudu. Then so that's the first thing that he mentioned: nom sleep. Then he said wamin al asbabi allati tanqudu al wudu, and also from the uh, from the indirect causes that nullify wudu: zawal al aqli, a person falling, uh, a person losing his intelligence, or you can say becoming the removal of. Uh, his awakeness or becoming unconscious, you can say, zawal al-aqli. Zawal means the removal, aql means awareness or intelligence. So if that happens and a person nullifies his wudu, so how does that happen? The author is going to mention bil junoon. Number one, by being affected by jinn, bil junoon, jannah. Yujunnu from junoon, 
But what it generally means here is to be mentally impaired. A person becomes mentally impaired, whether that is naturally or whether that is uh, by a jinn. And what do we generally mean by naturally? mean that he's mentally impaired, that he no longer can respond to a person who is to address him. You understand? So a person, you say to him, you say to him something he can't understand, he can't respond. You tell him to pick up a, you know, you tell him to, um, for example, the person was sane and then he was affected by a jinn, then, and to the point that he can't really understand what you're saying. Like if you say something to me, he can't respond, he's, he's totally, his, his aql is totally gone as if he's unconscious, then that will nullify his wudu, which means if a person was affected by a jinn, but he was, he could still respond to you and he could naturally respond to you, then his wudu wouldn't become nullified. You understand? Because that's not zawal al aql that's not, that's not losing a person's, he's not losing his consciousness. You understand? So that's why the author in uh, Al Abi he says when he says when he mentions uh, Junoon he says Allah tara ala al akli fazala anhu shu'ur it is that type of thing that overtakes his intelligence so he no longer he, he has no law his senses are no longer working right now the second one is well igma igma means fainting so if a person were to pass out and then wake back up, then his wudu would be gone because zawal al-akli was sukri becoming intoxicated. So a person became intoxicated. And what level does it mean for a person to become intoxicated? It doesn't mean when a person, for example, sips alcohol and becomes a little tipsy. That's not what is referred to. Intoxication, how do the scholars define it? Some of the scholars define intoxication as when a person is, um, he can no longer distinguish between evil and good, meaning he can no longer, I mean, harm and danger. For example, you notice when a person when a person's not drunk, you know, and five people are surrounding him, he won't fight, right? But now when he's when he's when he's when he's drunk and he's heavily intoxicated, five people surround him, and he's and he's and he swears that he can take on the world. He no longer distinguishes between um, harm and danger, or as the Quran defines it, that a person no longer knows what he's saying. He's just talking. A, peop, a person gets wasted. He's just, uh, you know, he gets wasted on uh, on intoxicants. He doesn't know what he's saying no more. He's just talking. You know, so much that if you were to ask him next morning, you know, what, you you're actually saying this, he would say, "No, I wasn't saying that. I never said that." So that when he when he reaches that level, then he becomes intoxicated. Here, it doesn't matter if he becomes to- intoxicated intentionally or un- unintentionally. Like when a person drinks something that, for example, he thought was uh, halal, he thought was just grape juice, but it ended up being alcohol, and he drank it, for example, and he became intoxicated. Whether that intoxication is halal or haram, intentionally or intentionally, and what do we mean? A person might ask, "What do you mean by halal intoxication?" Sometimes, for example, let's say uh, milk. Milk is halal, but somebody left it under the sun inside of a bottle and you didn't know that and you didn't know that um, it became in, intoxicating and you drank it then in that case um, it would do would still be notified because what matters is the ha- is not whether you did it intentionally or not but whether or not zawal al-akli took, took place whether or not the removal of a person's intellect and consciousness has taken place and whether it's halal or haram it has taken place so the next thing that he moves on to was is وَيَنْتَقِدُ wudu بِرْرِدَّةِ we seek Allah's refuge from that. Ridda means a person leaving Islam. Because when a person leaves leaves Islam, then all of his actions become nullified. So, obviously, if all of his actions are going to be, become nullified, then bidarajatil awla, and then more li- then more so is his actions. I mean, it's his wudu. His wudu will become nullified as well. Uh, and as uh, and as the scholars mentioned as well as a person who leaves the deen of Islam, then if he had performed Hajj previously to that, then that would mean that he would have to repeat his Hajj as well because his uh, he because he nullified all of his actions. So may Allah protect us from that. Uh, and having doubt in Hadith, uh, well, most people being in um, communities that are Hanafi, then. There, the ruling according to the Hanafis is opposite to this. Shak fil hadith here means that a person has dealt whether or not he broke his wudu. So, for example, in the in Hanafi madhab, if you if you made wudu and you have dealt whether or not you broke it, then they apply the principle. 
Aliyakinu la yuzalu bishek that that the akin doesn't remove. If you're certain that you did something, then doubt whether or not you 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 nullify that. Um, it, it doesn't have any effect according to the Maliki school, and or according to what is mentioned in the text here, that doubt nullifies hadith. Now here he's mentioning it briefly, and the brief uh, translation of this is that doubt in whether or not you broke your wudu nullifies your wudu. Meaning, what does it mean, shek fil hadith? It means that you know you made wudu, but you have doubt, did I break it or did I not break it? So sometimes this happens to people where, you know, they know they made wudu at 6 o'clock, then Maghrib comes in at 7 and they're thinking, hey, did I break my wudu? In that case, and according to the Malikiya, the med, our medhab is ihtiyat. Our medhab is that we should we, that that caution must be excessively taken in worship. And Imam Malik was of the view that a person doesn't have wudu. Now, what the author mentions here is only briefly. He mentions one type, meaning a person knows he made wudu and he broke it. But if we turn to Alizia. The text of al is as follows. He says, أَشَّكُّ فِي وُجُودِ الطَّهَارَةِ أَوْ فِي الْحَدَثِ أَوْ فِي السَّابِقِ مِنْهُمَا مَا لَمْ يَسْتَنْكِحُ الشك. al says that what nullifies wudu has a couple, there's a couple kinds. He says, a person has dealt fi وجود tahara." That he has doubt whether or not he has tahara. So you can write down these surahs. I'll give them to you. You can write down these different examples. The first type is, as al mentions here, a person has doubt whether or not he's in the state of tahara. So what does this mean? Write it down like this. Number one, he knows that he broke his wudu, but he has doubt whether or not he made his wudu after that. So after Asr prayer, he know he he knew he knows for sure that he broke his wudu. But then Maghrib comes in and he has doubt. Did I make wudu before I left the masjid or did I not make wudu before I left the masjid? Or when I before I left my house, did I make wudu? That's number one that nullifies wudu. The second one he mentions, Awfil Hadath. And that's the one that is mentioned in the text here. So this second one that al is mentioning is the one that's written here in al ashmawiyah But the first one we mentioned is not written in al ashmawiyah The first one that we mentioned in al aziyah So the second one that you can write down anyways is the one here from al ashmawiyah He knows he made wudu. He certainly made wudu. But he has dealt whether or not he broke it. That also necessitates wudu. Okay. Now the third one is... Where a person knows that he made wudu and he knows that he nullified his wudu or he did something from the ahdath, like he knows that he knows that he passed gas, but he can't remember which one happened first. He, does, he can't remember which one happened first. Did I did I make wudu first or did I did I urinate first? Did I go to the washroom first or did I? This will nullify wudu. You understand? Now there's a small condition here, ma lam yastankihu ashak. The first one that I mentioned to you is absolute, unconditional. The second one that I mentioned to you is absolute, also is unconditional. The third one that I mentioned to you now, where he knows he did one of the two, but he's not sure which one came first or second, that's conditional. Meaning that it would only nullify wudu in the case when a person is not riddled with doubt, meaning a person's not affected by constant doubt. That's what it means by uh, from the in the Al Iziyah text, Malam Yastan Kihu Ashek, meaning that a person is not excessively excessively overpowered by doubt. So in the case where you where you made wudu and you made and you made uh, and you made uh, and you and you and for example you urinated but you just have dealt which one happened first then your wudu will break as long as you're not a person that has lots of doubts what and how do we determine what is lots of doubt lots of doubt is defined in two ways some of the ulama say that it it's ha, it's habitual meaning it add a 10 in normal 
in normal circumstances, this usually happens to you. So it becomes customary for you now that every time you 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 make wudu and you and you and you pass gas and then the prayer comes in or you do something else, then you're like, I can't remember which one which one which one happened first. Then your wudu is still in place. Because the reason why it's overlooked is because if you act too much on your doubt in this case, then the doubt will increase. Or a second way, a second way to define it is that a person doubts one time in a day. So what does it mean by he doubts one time in a day? Meaning that doubt has to happen at least once prior to you applying this ruling. For example, let's say for the Dhuhr prayer now, you're going to pray now and now you don't remember whether which one came first, whether the wudu or the hadith came first, but now you want to pray Dhuhr. Now, early in Fajr, the same thing happened to you. Now that it's happened in Fajr once in the day, now if it happens to you a second time in the day, then you won't, you, it's, not obligate, it's not obligatory to make wudu now because of the fact that it's already happened once in the day. However, if it didn't happen at Fajr and it's only happening to you the first time, meaning today, I mean, the, the, the Dhuhr prayer is the first time that it's happening to you, then in that case, uh, in that case, wudu becomes obligatory because it's the first time that it happened to you. So in short, in order for it to apply, it has to be the second time that it's happening in a day. Now the third thing that he mentions is the, a person, a male touching his own private part, referring to the penis of a male that is attached to his body. Meaning, meaning it, it has to be attached to his body. So it has to be his, it's referring to his own and it should be attached to his body as opposed to uh, the case uh, for whatever reason it became severed from a person's body, then that's not going to nullify a person's wudu. So basically what he's referring to here is the normal circumstance of a person touching his private part, but touching his private part, sorry. That is under the condition it will nullify his prayer, I mean nullify his wudu under the condition that he touches it with the palm of his hand, meaning the inner palm of his hand, or the inner palm side of the fingers. So meaning the whole inside of the hand, including the palm and the inside of the fingers, or the side of his fingers. So if he was to open up two of his fingers and hold it like, for example, like the way two scissors come together, then that would nullify, that would nullify his wudu. What does it mean if a person were to touch it with the back of his hand or he were to make a fist and wash and wash it with the fist so that the, the palm of the hand doesn't touch the, the private part, then, uh, then it will not nullify his wudu. According to the Ahnaf, according to the Hanafiya, absolutely touching the private part doesn't nullify wudu because they're applying one of the, they're, they're acting upon one hadith where a person uh, ask the Prophet ﷺ about touching his private part and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, isn't it none other than a piece of your skin or a piece of your body? Right? And then we have other hadith that mention that uh, a person whoever touches his uh, whoever touches his private part then he should make wudu. So according to the Shafi'is they're going to act on that hadith absolutely that a person who touches his private part then it nullifies his wudu. However the Malikiyah act upon both hadith by saying that if a person touches it with the outside of his hand, then his wudu won't break. However, if he touches it with the inside of his hand, then it will nullify the it will nullify nullify the wudu. The the reason for the difference is because touching it with the outside of his hand doesn't generally necessitate necessitate um, sexual inclination or sexual thought. Whereas touching it with the inside of the hand Unfortunately, some people masturbate. Nobody masturbates with the outside of their hand, but the inside of their hand. Uh, however, it's not permissible. We're just showing you the for the for the sake of giving an example. 
then it will nullify will do because if you if you paid attention earlier we said that the the everything listed under asbab are generally reason why we call them indirect causes because in most cases they are reasons for the actual hadith to happen so example sleeping sleeping when a person generally sleeps he tends to pass gas so it causes the passing of gas which is from the ahdath now if we look at zawal al-aqli zawal al-aqli does everything else usually when a person passes out he urinates because all of his body becomes loose or he passes gas as well same thing here with touching the private part when a person touches the private part then it is a cause for it is a cause for madhi to come out. For example, when a person masturbates, if he doesn't ejacul uh, ejaculate, then at least he's going to get an erection and that's going to cause the coming out of um, madhi. So that's why it nullifies wudu.